a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classics and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. Greetings, listeners. We're back once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits like the Dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are Lovecrafty and leaning. Weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places of cyclopean ruins and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, This is an exploration of the Cthulhu Mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, Season 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kent Fulmer. Time and the Gods by Lord Dunsany. Preface. These tales are of the things that befell gods and men in Yarnith, Averon, and Zarkandu, and in the other countries of my dreams. Part 1. Time and the Gods Once, when the gods were young, and only their swarthy servant Time was without age, the gods lay sleeping by a broad river upon earth. There, in a valley that from all the earth the gods had set apart for their repose, the gods dreamed marble dreams. And with domes and pinnacles the dreams arose and stood up proudly between the river and the sky, all shimmering white to the morning. In the city's midst the gleaming marble of a thousand steps climbed to the citadel, where arose four pinnacles beckoning to heaven, and midmost between the pinnacles there stood the dome, vast as the gods had dreamed it. All around, terrace by terrace, there went marble lawns, well guarded by onyx lions, and carved with effigies of the gods striding amid the symbols of the worlds. With a sound like tinkling bells far off in a land of shepherds hidden by some hill, the waters of many fountains turned again home. Then the gods awoke, and there stood Sardathrion. Not to common men have the gods given to walk Sardathrion's streets, and not to common eyes to see her fountains. Only to those to whom in lonely passes in the night the gods have spoken, leaning through the stars. To those that have heard the voices of the gods above the morning, or seen their faces bending above the sea. Only to those hath it been given to see Sardathrion, to stand where her pinnacles gathered together in the night, fresh from the dreams of gods. For round the valley a great desert lies through which no common traveler may come. But those whom the gods have chosen feel suddenly a great longing at heart, and crossing the mountains that divide the desert from the world, set out across it, driven by the gods, till hidden in the desert's midst they find the valley at last, and look with eyes upon Sardathrion. In the desert beyond the valley grow a myriad thorns, and all pointing towards Sardathrion. 
So may many that the gods have loved come to the marble city, but none can return, for other cities are no fitting home for men whose feet have touched Sardathrion's marble streets, where even the gods have not been ashamed to come in the guise of men with their cloaks ramped about their faces. Therefore no city shall ever hear the songs that are sung in the marble citadel by those in whose ears have rung the voices of the gods. No report shall ever come to other lands of the music of the fall of Sardathrion's fountains, when the waters which went heavenward return again into the lake, where the gods cool their brows sometimes in the guise of men. None may ever hear the speech of the poets of that city, to whom the gods have spoken. It stands a city aloof. There hath been no rumor of it. I alone have dreamed of it, and I may not be sure that my dreams are true. Above the twilight, the gods were seated in the after years, ruling the worlds. No longer now they walked at evening in the marble city, hearing the fountains splash, or listening to the singing of the men they loved, because it was the after years, and the work of the gods was to be done. But often as they rested a moment from doing the work of the gods, from hearing the prayers of men, or sending here the pestilence, or there the mercy, they would speak a while with one another of the olden years, saying, Rememberest thou not Sardathrion? And another would answer, Ah, Sardathrion, and all Sardathrion's misdraped marble lawns whereon we walk not now. Then the gods turned to do the work of the gods, answering the prayers of men or smiting them, and ever they sent their swarthy servant time to heal or overwhelm. And time went forth into the worlds to obey the commands of the gods, yet he cast furtive glances at his masters, and the gods distrusted time, because he had known the worlds or ever the gods became. One day, when furtive time had gone into the worlds to nimbly smite some city whereof the gods were weary, the gods above the twilight, speaking to one another, said, Surely we are the lords of time and gods of the worlds besides. See how our city Sardathrion lifts over other cities? Others arise and perish, but Sardathrion standeth yet, the first and the last of cities. Rivers are lost in the sea, and streams forsake the hills, but ever Sardathrion's fountains arise in our dream city. As was Sardathrion when the gods were young, so are her streets today as a sign that we are the gods. Suddenly the swart figure of time stood up before the gods with both hands dripping with blood and a red sword dangling idly from his fingers, and said, Sardathrion is gone! I have overthrown it! And the gods said, Sardathrion, Sardathrion, the marble city? Thou? Thou hast overthrown it? Thou, the slave of the gods? And the eldest of the gods said, Sardathrion, Sardathrion, and is Sardathrion gone? And furtively time looked him in the face and edged towards him, fingering with his dripping fingers the hilt of his nimble sword. Then the gods feared with a new fear that he that had overthrown their city would one day slay the gods, and a new cry went wailing through the twilight, the lament of the gods for their dream city, crying, Tears may not bring again Sardathrion, but this the gods may do who have seen and seen with unrelenting eyes the sorrows of ten thousand worlds. Thy gods may weep for thee. Tears may not bring again Sardathrion. Believe it not, Sardathrion, that ever thy gods sent this doom to thee, he that hath overthrown thee shall overthrow thy gods. How oft when night came suddenly on morning, playing in the fields of twilight, did we watch thy pinnacles emerging from the darkness. Sardathrion, Sardathrion, dream city of the gods, and thine onyx lions, looming limb by limb from the dusk. How often have we sent our child the dawn to play with thy fountain tops? How often hath evening, loveliest of our goddesses, strayed long upon thy balconies? Let one fragment of thy marble stand up above the dust for thine old gods to caress, as a man, when all else is lost, treasures one lock of the hair of his beloved. Sardathrion, the gods must kiss once more the place where thy streets were once. There were wonderful marbles in thy streets, Sardathrion. Sardathrion, Sardathrion, the gods weep for thee. The Coming of the Sea Once there was no sea, and the gods went walking over the green plains of earth. We'd like to thank you for listening to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Our sponsor is BunnySlippers.com, your finest source of wonderful Cthulhu slippers and cool, cool shirts from FoundItemClothing.com, your favorite shirts from your favorite cult films. 
and also these fine folks. Upon an evening of the forgotten years, the gods were seated on the hills, and all the little rivers of the world lay coiled at their feet asleep. When Slid, the new god, striding through the stars, came suddenly upon the earth lying in a corner of space. And behind Slid there marched a million waves, all following Slid and tramping up the twilight. And Slid touched earth in one of her great green valleys that divided the south, and here he encamped for the night with all of his waves about him. But to the gods, as they sat upon their hilltops, a new cry came crying over the green spaces that lay below the hills. And the gods said, This is neither the cry of life, nor yet the whisper of death. What is this new cry that the gods have never commanded, yet which comes to the ears of the gods? And the gods together, shouting, made the cry of the south, calling the south wind to them. And again the gods shouted all together, making the cry of the north, calling the north wind to them. And thus they gathered to them all their winds, and sent these four into the low plains, to find what thing it was that called with the new cry, and to drive it away from the gods. Then all the winds harnessed up their clouds, and drave forth till they came to the great green valley that divided the south in twain, and there found Slid with all his waves about him. Then for a space Slid and the four winds struggled with one another, till the strength of the winds was gone, and they limped back to the gods, their masters, and said, We have met this new thing that has come upon the earth, and have striven against its armies, but could not drive them forth. And the new thing is beautiful, but very angry, and is creeping toward the gods. But Slid advanced, and led his armies up the valley, and inch by inch, and mile by mile, he conquered the lands of the gods. Then from their hills the gods sent down a great array of cliffs against hard red rocks, and bade them march against Slid. And the cliffs marched down till they came and stood before Slid, and leaned their heads forward and frowned and stood staunch to guard the lands of the gods against the might of the sea, shutting Slid off from the world. Then Slid sent some of his smaller waves to search out what stood against him, and the cliffs shattered them. But Slid went back and gathered together a horde of his greatest waves and hurled them against the cliffs, and the cliffs shattered them. And again Slid called up out of his deep a mighty array of waves, and sent them roaring against the guardians of the gods, and the red rocks frowned and smote them. And once again Slid gathered his greater waves and hurled them against the cliffs, and when the waves were scattered like those before them, the feet of the cliffs were no longer standing firm, and their faces were scarred and battered. Then into every cleft that stood in the rocks, Slid sent his hugest wave, and others followed behind it, and Slid himself seized hold of huge rocks with his claws, and tore them down and stamped them under his feet. And when the tumult was over, the sea had won, and over the broken remnants of those red cliffs the armies of Slid marched on and up the long green valley. Then the gods heard Slid exulting far away, and singing songs of triumph over their battered cliffs and ever the tramp of his army sounded nearer and nearer in the listening ears of the gods. Then the gods called to their downlands to save their world from Slid, and the downlands gathered themselves and marched away a great white line of gleaming cliffs, and halted before Slid. Then Slid advanced no more and lulled his legions, and while his waves were low he softly crooned a song such as once long ago had troubled the stars and brought down tears out of the twilight. Sternly the cliffs stood on guard to save the world of the gods, but the song that once had troubled the stars went moaning on, awakening pent desires, till full at the feet of the gods the melody fell. Then the blue rivers that lay curled asleep opened their gleaming eyes, uncurled themselves and shook their rushes, and making a stir among the hills crept down to find the sea. And passing across the world they came at last to where the white cliffs stood, and coming behind them split them here and there, and went through their broken ranks to Slid at last. And the gods were angry with their traitorous streams. Then Slid ceased from singing the song that lures the world, and gathered up his legions, and the rivers lifted their heads with the waves, and all went marching on to assail the cliffs of the gods. And wherever the rivers had broken the ranks of the cliffs, 
Slid's armies went surging in and broke them into islands and shattered the islands away. And the gods on their hilltops heard once more the voice of Slid exulting over their cliffs. Already more than half the world lay subject to Slid, and still his armies advanced, and the people of Slid, the fishes and the long eels, went in and out of arbors that once were dear to the gods. Then the gods feared for their dominion, and to the innermost sacred recesses of the mountains, to the very heart of the hills, the gods trooped off together, and there found Tintagon, a mountain of black marble staring far over the earth, and spake thus to him with the voices of the gods. O oh, eldest born of our mountains, when we first devised the earth we made thee, and thereafter fashioned fields and hollows, valleys and other hills to lie about thy feet. And now Tintagon, thine ancient lords, the gods, are facing a new thing which overthrows the old. Go therefore, thou Tintagon, and stand up against Slid, that the gods be still the gods, and the earth still green. And hearing the voices of his sires, the elder gods, Tintagon strode down through the evening, leaving a wake of twilight broad behind him as he strode, and going across the green earth came down to Ambrady at the valley's edge, and there met the foremost of Slid's fierce armies conquering the world. And against him Slid hurled the force of a whole bay, which lashed itself high over Tintagon's knees, and streamed around his flanks and then fell and was lost. Tintagon still stood firm for the honor and dominion of his lords, the elder gods. Then Slid went to Tintagon and said, Let us now make a truce. Stand thou back from Ambrady, and let me pass through thy ranks, that mine armies may now pass up the valley which opens on the world, that the green earth that dreams around the feet of the older gods shall now know the new god, Slid. Then shall mine armies strive with thee no more, and thou and I shall be the equal lords of the whole earth when all the world is singing the chaunt of Slid, and thy head alone shall be lifted above mine armies when rival hills are dead. And I will deck thee with all the robes of the sea, and all the plunder that I have taken in rare cities shall be piled before thy feet. Tintagon, I have conquered all the stars. My song swells through all the space besides. I come victorious from Mon and Kanagat on the farthest edge of the worlds. And thou and I are to be equal lords when the old gods are gone, and the green earth knoweth slid. Behold me gleaming azure and fair with a thousand smiles, and swayed by a thousand moods. And Tintagon answered, I am staunch and black, and have one mood, and this to defend my masters and their green earth. Then Slid went backward growling, and summoned together the waves of a whole sea, and sent them singing full in Tintagon's face. Then from Tintagon's marble front the sea fell backwards, crying onto a broken shore, and ripple by ripple straggled back to Slid, saying, Tintagon stands! Far out beyond the battered shore that lay at Tintagon's feet, Slid rested long, and sent the Nautilus to drift up and down before Tintagon's eyes, and he and his army sat singing idle songs of dreamy islands far away to the south, and of the still stars whence they had stolen forth, of twilight evenings and long ago. Still Tintagon stood with his feet planted fair upon the valley's edge, defending the gods and their green earth against the sea. And all the while that Slid sang his songs and played with the Nautilus that sailed up and down, he gathered his oceans together. One morning, as Slid sang of old outrageous wars, and most enchanting peace, and of dreamy islands, and the south wind and the sun, he suddenly launched five oceans out of the deep all to attack Tintagon. And the five oceans sprang upon Tintagon and passed above his head. One by one the grip of the oceans loosened, one by one they fell back into the sea, and still Tintagon stood. And on that morning the might of all five oceans lay dead at Tintagon's feet. That which Slid had conquered he still held, and there is now no longer a great green valley in the south. But all that Tintagon had guarded against Slid he gave back to the gods. Very calm the sea lies now about Tintagon's feet where he stands all black amid crumbled cliffs of white with red rocks piled about his feet. And often the sea retreats far out along the shore, and often wave by wave comes marching in with the sound of the tramping of armies, that all may still remember the great fight that surged about Tintagon once, when he guarded the gods and the green earth against Slid. Sometimes in their dreams the war-scarred warriors of Slid still lift their heads and cry their battle cry. 
Then do dark clouds gather about Tintagon's swarthy brow, and he stands out menacing, seen afar by ships where once he conquered Slid. And the gods know well that while Tintagon stands, they and their world are safe. And whether Slid shall one day smite Tintagon is hidden among the secrets of the sea. Thank you for listening to this episode of People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. I have been your sound editor, D.B. Spitzer. Check us out at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, pgttcm.threadless.com. How about, I don't know, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We are People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, and most social media, we're just PGTTCM. Thank you so much for listening, and join us again next week for some more Lord Dunsany. Unless this is episode reading 77, then hey, on to the next book. <laughs>